And today, if the Lord will help us, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about, you know, heaven. Um, if the Lord will help us, you know, uh, because I really believe if we really uh, think on that and think about what God has done for us and how God has blessed us and how we can look forward to every day as being Christian, look forward to every day as being a child of God, and what we can look forward to, that one day we're going to spend all eternity with the Lord. I think that uh, it should get us a little bit excited, a little bit stirred up, and a little bit you know, energized to go forth and do what God has asked us to do. So in the 21st uh, chapter of Revelation, okay, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you once again for the opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for your holy anointed word that you've given us to teach us, to guide us, to lead us in all things. And Lord, we ask that you anoint us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet to speak the words you would have us to say. Anoint the ears of the people to hear these words. And Lord, let's give, it, give you the praise for all you do, Lord, as you strive to bring this country back to service under you. As Lord, we ask that your word go forth, that it goes forth and that it touches hearts, that it changes lives that he sets the sinner free, that he delivers the outcast in the attic. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. See, as, as John started speaking about what he saw in that 21st chapter of Revelation, he started talking about heaven. And as I start talking about heaven today, I feel like I'm going to fall short too because even Paul couldn't adequately, I mean, John couldn't adequately uh, describe what he saw. John couldn't adequately describe. He tried to describe something that was indescribable. He tried to express feelings that he couldn't possibly imagine. He had never seen or anything before. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote in the second chapter, in the ninth verse, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. See, he's prepared something for us that we've never seen before. He's prepared something for us that we've never heard before. And so, you know, as we sit here and we try to imagine heaven and we try to do all this, you know, as we go through and we want to talk about, oh, the streets of gold, and we want to talk about the gates of pearl, and we want to talk about the walls of jasper, we can't possibly imagine that because I drive around on asphalt. I drive around on gravel. I drive around on all kinds of, I walk on sidewalks of concrete. I have never walked on gold. I got news for you. It's going to be something to behold. So as we sit here, as we try to explain that, we can't, we can't explain it. We can't understand it. We can't possibly fathom what God has got prepared for us because John couldn't figure it out, which reminds me of a story. I like stories. <laughs> the story goes, there was a rich guy. And he was really rich. And he was concerned that when he was going to die, he was going to lose all this stuff and leave all this stuff. So he prayed and he prayed. Now, this is a made-up story, y'all. I'm just going to tell you that right now. This is made up. It's not real. Okay. Okay. But he, he prayed and prayed, Lord, you know, I've got so much stuff. I want to bring some of it with him. And God's like, you don't need that here. I want to bring it. And finally, God said, okay, fine. If it, it's going to worry you that much, bother you that much, just go ahead. You can bring a suitcase. Well, long story short, the guy dies. And so he's walking up to the pearly gates, St. Peter, and he's dragging the suitcase behind him. And he's dragging the suitcase behind him. And Peter's like, whoa, what are you doing? 
you're not supposed to be bringing anything into heaven. He goes, it's okay. God told me I could bring a suitcase of stuff. And Peter's like, I, um, I don't think so. But, you know, let's see what you got in the suitcase. So the guy opens the suitcase, and there's gold bars, and there's gold coins, and there are ingots. And Peter's like, well, I don't know why you brought a bunch of paving stuff up to heaven. We don't need that stuff here. See, that's the way it is. Here on earth, we value things more than they value things in heaven. See, our values are going to be different. Our feelings are going to be different. You know, we know that. So it, too many times we think the stuff down here that's going to be a problem, the stuff down here that's going to be something that we need. Oh, I've got to have gold. I've got to have this, that, and the other. When we get to heaven, we're not going to care about a 401K. When we get to Kevin, heaven, we're not going to worry about the doctor's bill. When we get to heaven, we're not going to worry about all this stuff down here that worries us all the time. We're not going to worry about loneliness and all that. You know, that 21st chapter said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. You know, as, and then he, got, then he got on, and he said, in that third verse, he said, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. He said, Hey, we don't have to worry about God being in heaven. We're going to be there with him. He's going to dwell there among us. Remember back when they talked about the Garden of Eden. You know, God would come down in the cool of the day and walk with Adam and Eve and commune with them and visit with them and ha you know, have fellowship with them. Right now, we think we've got to get, come to a church and we've got to get to an altar. We've got to pray and we've got to do all this other stuff. But one of these days, we're going to be living in a city whose builder and maker is God. We're going to be living in a city that there is no more sorrow, no more heartache, and we're going to have God right there with us, to fellowship with us, to have right there, but oh, but think about it, you know, there is a heaven that's a real place, you know, easy, I got all kinds of help right up here, but you know, we think that Every, everything's like messed up in our life. And it might be, because this life, it said the old earth is going to pass away. The old heaven's going to pass away. And I'm going to bring a new heaven and a new earth, a place that's not, you know, not tainted by sin, that's not tainted by corruption, that's not messed up in any old way, shape, or form. It says, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God, and I'm going to dwell there with you. And it's going to be perfect enough that I can walk around with you. See, the stuff that we go through in life, we carry Jesus with us. We carry the Holy Spirit with us. We're walking around in a lot of stuff. But sometimes the things that we hear, we don't want Jesus to hear. Sometimes the thing we have to witness day to day, we, we don't want Jesus to witness. See, we're going to a land where we don't have to worry about locking our doors at night. We're going to a land where we don't have to worry about child abuse. We're going to a land where we don't have to worry about suicide bombers. We're going to a land where we don't have to worry about alarm systems. We're going to a land where we can have peace. We don't have to worry about somebody knocking on our door in the middle of the night telling us about our kid or our grandkid. We don't, we're going to a land where we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Yeah. See, you know, Brother Keith said, you know, I, you know, I want to preach the good stuff. Well, today I'm preaching some good stuff, Brother Keith. <laughs> there was a Sunday school teacher, you know, one time that, this was years ago, and I remember reading it in Reader's Digest. And she, was, and she wrote down, you know, what do you, what do you think about, what do you think about heaven? What do you think about heaven? What's it going to be like? And one third grader wrote, heaven's going to be the happiest part of my dead life. <laughs> See? And that's kind of the way it is. Heaven's going to be the happiest part of our life. When we leave this earth, heaven's going to be the happiest part of that. You know, sometimes we think, oh, death is something sad. But heaven's going to be the happiest part of when we depart this old earth. See, too many cultures, you know, we've gotten into a situation here in America where we don't believe in heaven. We don't believe in hell. You know, oh, everybody's going to heaven, whatever that may be. But culture after culture over the course of history, Egyptians built pyramids with hundreds of thousands of slaves, built these big giant things. And 
And they shoved it full of gold and clothes. And they even shoved servants in there. So when the pharaohs woke up in their afterlife, that they would have plenty of stuff to wear. They would have plenty of stuff to eat. They would have servants. And those servants died in there with the pharaohs, and they just went ahead and went on. The, the Norse people, they believed in Odin and going to Valhalla. They believed in an afterlife. The Indians, they believed going to the happy hunting ground, and they even buried bows and arrows and lances with their Indian warriors. They all thought about the afterlife. But now, we don't think about the afterlife. We want it now. We want it now. You know, Grubhub, we want it all. We want it all. We want it all. We want it now. That's the way we are. We don't think about the afterlife. We don't think about the consequences. We don't think about all that other stuff. We just want stuff now. Now, don't get me wrong. We should be concerned about today. We should be, you know, we should be paying our bills. We should be paying, you know, all of our stuff off. We should be taking care of the things that today. Today is important. But today is important because today is the day of salvation. That's why today is important. That's why the presence matters because we're supposed to be worried about salvation. See, the Bible tells us that. That's what today is all about. Today is the salvation. Today is all about that. You know, I'm, I'm on a diet. Some of you have been kind enough to tell me I'm losing weight. But the one thing that keeps me going is tomorrow's his, yesterday was history. Tomorrow's a mystery. And today is a present. See, I can't go back and change anything that happens yesterday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All I've got guaranteed of is today. And if my sins aren't under the blood of Jesus Christ, if my sins aren't where they need to be, see, all I've got control of is what I do today. See, I can't go back and change yesterday. If I messed up, that's what repentance is all about. If I messed up, that's what the altar of prayer is all about. If I mess up, that's what grace is all about. So today, I can live only today. Tomorrow, I can't guarantee I'm only going to be here tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. See, but too many times, that attitude affects the church. I want it now. Preacher, I want you to preach the situation that I'm in right now. I want you to help me with the problem that I've got right now. I want you to preach me happy right now. Never mind that the teaching, the preaching might be for a trial you're going to go through next week or next month. You know, we need to make sure that we're not just looking about now, now, now. We've got to come to the house of God, and we've got to get lifted up. We've got to get encouraged. We've got to be excited about the Lord and coming together. We've got to get excited about going out and doing what the Lord has called us to do. We've got to get excited about coming together with one mind, with one accord, like the apostles did, for one purpose, to be witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. We've got to allow that power to come on us so that we can be witnesses. See, Jesus said, hey... What if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What does it profit you? You know, we're so worried about, you know, all this other stuff. See, he didn't give me this world to enjoy. See, some, some people think, oh, well, Jesus gave me this life so I can enjoy the whole world. No, he didn't. He gave us life to be in service to him. He gave us this life. He said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. And that abundant life is not about your bank account. It's not about the stuff you've got. There's a lot more important things than that. We've got to be out reaching a lost and dying world. We've got to be out there reaching and ministering to people that need help, people that need hope. We've got to be out there reaching our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our coworkers. We've got to be out there telling what Jesus Christ said. But if we are a hot mess ourselves, can't seem to get through a day without losing our mind, wanting to pull what little hair we've got out... What kind of witness is that? Yeah, what kind of encouragement is that to a lost night world? Lord have mercy. You look at that person. I'll just take my nerve pill and be happy. I don't need what they got. But if we go through life with a smile on our face, we go through life, I'm fantastic. 
We go through life. It doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter the circumstances. We are fantastic because we are children of the King. We are fantastic because He is our hope. We are fantastic because we know where our soul is secured. We are fantastic for that reason. See, we need to understand that. But too many times, when I was a younger Christian, and I, was read, I used to read a lot of I still read a lot of stuff, but there was a minister called Billy Hybels. And he talked about when he was a kid, he was in a children's choir. And they had to put on robes, and they had to stand on risers like you did in elementary school. And they had to stand still for hours and practice. And the choir director said, if you don't like doing this, Billy, you're not going to be very happy in heaven. So we've got a lot of kids out there thinking, you know, the same way. We tell them to come into the house of God, and you sit on that pew, and you be quiet, and you keep your mouth shut. And they think, because you're not going to be happy when you get to heaven if you can't be good. Hey, we can't be happy if we don't get to heaven, first of all. We can't be happy, but when we come to the house of God, you know, yes, we should act a certain way. We should behave respectfully, but, you know, when kids are enjoying the word of the Lord, when kids are raising their hands, when kids are praising God, let them praise on. Let them get, you know, we, if he said, hey, if you all aren't going to praise, I'm going to let the rocks cry out. So if we want to sit there and go, don't be surprised some three-year-old going, praise the Lord. Let them praise. See, too many times we make... We make kids think that church is some gloom and doom place, that there's no joy, that there's no happiness, that there's no fun. Listen to me. I don't have to drink a drink of alcohol. I don't have to smoke a joint. I don't have to shoot anything in my arm. And I've got joy. I've got peace. I've got happiness. And I can have a good time no matter what's going on because I've got the joy of Jesus Christ in my heart. So let the kids get full of a little bit of joy. Let them enjoy being in the house of God. Let them enjoy raising their hands. Let them enjoy knowing what the presence of God is all about. See, too many times it's like that. But we, we so get so caught up in what heaven looks like. The streets of gold. The gates of pearls. The jasper walls, like I said before. But... The 21st chapter of Revelation talks about more than just that. See, it talks about relationships. See, it talks about relationships. And that's why we're here. That's why we're going to heaven, because of the relationship that we have with God. Because of that relationship that we have. He talks about us as being a family. He talks about being our father. He said, call me Abba, father, or daddy. I don't know about you, but I don't call a lot of people daddy. I call my dad dad. That was it. Everybody else I treat with respect and stuff, but he wants to be our dad, not just father. He wants to be our dad. He wants us to be sons and daughters. It's about relationship. See, and it, we're part of one family. He calls us brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. He wants us to love one another just like a family, and that's what it's all about. And if we're part of that family of God, then we should have a relationship with one another that treats each other like family, that treats each other like we care about one another. You know, we need to understand that, you know, heaven is going to be a place with a new relationship. Remember, he said, I've created a new heaven, a new earth. I'm going to create a new thing. See, he's saying, hey, it's going to be completely different than anything you've had here on earth. Why? Because our relationship with God down here is imperfect because we're imperfect. It's going to have to be something new because now we've been purified. We're standing before him in white robes. There's no more doubt. There's no more fear. There's no more anxiety. There's no more sin. There's no more temptation because we're standing in a brand new heaven with a brand new earth and we're standing there in God without sin without spot, without blemish, so we can have a new relationship with him. Amen. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 10th verse, it's talking about Abraham when he said, you know, he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose builder and maker were God. See, that's what I'm looking forward to, to a city one of these days where God was the builder and maker. See, all my adult life, I've lived in houses that were mine, but somebody else built them. Somebody else lived there before me. Now, don't get me wrong, they're nice houses. I like them, but I always imagine what it would be like to have my own house built to the way I like it, 
to my taste, to have, you know, I'd have a media room and a music room. I have a lot of different rooms, maybe a man cave or whatever. I don't know. But see, God has prepared a place for us. He's built something that's just for me, just for me. He, he's, he said, I've been preparing a place for you, and I'm going to prepare it. And, and know this, that I'm going to prepare it, and one day I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. He said, I'm going to make a place just for you. Amen. See, I don't have to worry about somebody's hand-me-downs. I don't have to worry about somebody that put a light switch down here or a light switch up there. And trust me, I've been in places that I had both. I lived in one place where I walked around a room for two days trying to find a light switch, and it was right inside the door right there. I don't know if they were midgets or what. Excuse me, little people, sorry. See, but I'm going to have a place that's built just for me. I'm going to have a place that's built just for me. And it says you're going to receive comfort there. He said there's going to be no more sin. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more tears. There, you know, our hearts are going to be mended. Our hearts are going to be mended. There's not going to be anything that's going to distract from us worshiping God. There's not going to be anything to distract us from being in the presence of God. We won't have the day-to-day -day worries. We won't be worrying about our kids. We won't be worrying about our finances. We won't be worrying about the Middle East. We won't be worrying about anything else. We'll be able to enjoy being in the presence of God. See, and it's an intimate relationship. Look at this second verse of this 21st chapter. It said, And I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down as from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He said, hey, John, that's me. I saw this coming down. I saw this coming down. And he said, he couldn't think of anything else, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's white and it's pure, just like a bride for her husband. See, He's trying to use some kind of language that people will understand because he can't fathom what he's seeing. And he goes, it's glorious. It's glorious. What I'm seeing is the most perfect bride that I could ever possibly imagine. And it's coming down adorned and ready for her husband, ready for the marriage. It's the most perfect thing that I ever see. And he said, and I heard a loud voice. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, the tabernacle of God is with men. God is going to dwell with us. See, he's going to dwell with us. See, too many times we get so worked up about all this stuff that we forget. He's going to dwell with us. Imagine how your life would be different if God dwelled with you. Imagine how your life would be different if when you're going through that trial, God's right there. Hey, I got you. Hey, don't look at that. Hey, let's go this way. One of these days, that's exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be no more trials, no more temptations, no more sin, nothing else. But see, if we could just understand that. See, one of these days, we're going to be pure. We're going to be faultless. We're going to be blameless. And it's going to be something, you know, it's going to be something that we can't, we can't fathom. We can't imagine our little bitty feeble little pea-sized brain. We can't imagine what it's going to be like. And it's also an individual relationship. See, in the sixth verse, it says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Look at that. He said, It's an individual. If you thirst, I'm going to give you freely of the water of life. If you're thirsty, all you got to do is drink. You don't have to ask. You don't have to pay for it. It's not like lemonade, five cents a cup. No. It's going to be freely. He said, I'm going to give it without cost. There's not going to be anything. See, we don't have to be concerned about our salvation ever again. We won't have to be concerned about what somebody's saying about us ever again. We won't have to be concerned about you know, what's going through our mind ever again because everything's going to be focused on God. Everything's going to be paying attention to God. and doing. See, we're not used to that. We're used to working for what we've got. 
You know, we're used to paying our bills. We're used to making it on our own. We're used to earning it by the sweat of our brow. We, we think we earn it and we deserve it and all that stuff. But there, you're not going to be able to earn it. There, you're not going to be able to deserve it. We are weak and undone without Jesus Christ. There's not a thing. This is the unmerited favor of God. This is the grace of God. And as we stand before him, we're going to be obviously humble because we haven't earned it. See, a lot of times we think we've got to somehow earn grace. And it messes us up. We've got to live holy. We've got to live righteous. But we didn't do anything to earn grace. We didn't do anything to deserve grace. We didn't do anything to earn being able to drink from the water of life freely, without cost. We didn't do any of that. See, one of these days, I'm going to be standing before God. And I'm going to be able to call him Dad. And he's going to call me Son. And he's, you know, there's a song that said, he called me son. If we could get that in our mind, or he called me daughter. If we could get that in our mind, how much God loves us, that he calls us son, that he calls us daughter, that he cares about. Think about the things that your children or your grandchildren may have done. You might be disappointed. You might be sad. But when they come to you with their arms open wide, you hug them, you forgive them, you never stopped loving them. Think about how much greater God's love is. Think about how much greater God's forgiveness is. See, he called me son. And, you know, we need to understand that that's not a light thing. That's not a thing. You know, as we get here, as we meet together each Sunday, each Wednesday, as we come together, you know, we need to think about what God wants us to do. See, do you come in the room? Oh, it's been a rough week. It may have been a rough week, but you're still a son or a daughter of God. Amen. You're still a child of the King. It may have been a rough week, but we are still entitled to the benefits of being a child of God. We are still entitled to being a citizen of heaven. We are still entitled to that. Not because of anything that we did. Not because of anything that we've accomplished. But because Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross. Because Jesus Christ shed his blood, was put in the tomb, and was risen again on the third day with the keys of death held in the grave. We are entitled to the benefits of child of the king because of who Jesus is and because we received him as our Lord and Savior. That's why when we come to the house of God, we can lift up holy hands. Not because you owe a lot of money. Not because of all the good things he's done. We lift up holy hands because Jesus Christ died for us and he is holy. See, it's all about heavenly relationships. We get caught up in what heaven looks like. We get caught up in all the things that heaven's going to be. But heaven's going to be a place where I can call him dad. Where he can call me son. And this, this relationship that I'm looking forward to is just an extension of the relationship that we've started down here on earth. See, it should just be an extension of that relationship that we've already started. So as they come to music, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't have that relationship that your sins are under the blood, if you don't have that relationship that you know, that you know, that you know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, then it's going to be, it's going to be rough getting through those pearly gates. You're not going to be able to drag a suitcase of stuff up there with you. You're not going to go, well, my mom prayed for me. My dad prayed for me. No. Jesus prayed for us. We've got to receive that. Let's all stand as they... Uh, as they come to the music, let's just, let's just have a good season of prayer. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this altar is open. If you're not sure that Jesus is your Savior, this altar is open. It's all about the relationship. Heaven's a great and glorious place. It's a new place. But it's not going to matter if that relationship's not right with the Lord. Let's come around and pray.